Good morning. I'm Jason Marzak, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arst Latin America Center. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning, whether it's virtually or always wonderful these days when we have a live in-person studio audience or so our studio audience as well. The U.S.-Mexico border is often in the news these days for issues of migration, but the border is much more than that. The border is an incredibly important source of commercial flows between the United States and Mexico, and it will be an increasingly important source as we look to near shore in the near future. A new transformed border will also bring incredible economic and security benefits for both countries. So what might just a 10 minute reduction in wait times mean? Today, we'll discuss the U.S.-Mexico border, its untapped potential, and also share how economic improvements in turn can enhance security. Today also marks the launch of our economic impact study in partnership with the Hunt Institute for Global Competitiveness at the University of Texas El Paso and Colegio de Frontera Norte in Tijuana, Mexico, and in partnership with the U.S. Department of State, where we called, it's called the economic impact of a more efficient U.S.-Mexico border, how reducing wait times at land ports of entry would promote commerce, resilience, and job creation. This is the fir first of a two-part series. We're joined today in studio by a number of uh, uh, panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. But first, I'm delighted that we're joined today by Todd Robinson, the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, the bureau with which we worked with uh, in producing this report. Prior to his appointment as Assistant Secretary, Ambassador Robinson has had an incredibly distinguished uh, career, uh, including as Chargé d'Affaires in, in Caracas, uh, Ambassador uh, to Guatemala, among his many other uh, posts. Uh, Assistant Secretary, so thank you so much for joining us today. We're also today, I think, celebrating nearly your one year anniversary uh, on, on the job three days away. So congratulations on that. We're lo really looking forward to your uh, perspective on the U.S.-Mexico border and the potential for binational cooperation to improve security and trade. So, Mr. Assistant Secretary, over to you. Thank you, Jason. And thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting us today. I'm pleased to see such a diverse group of uh, stakeholders in attendance as well. The shared U.S.-Mexico border is not a, a line in the sand. It's an ecosystem of many different players and parts, from business to government to tribal communities, from infrastructure to environment to technology and to people. Seeing representatives here from the public sector, the private sector, and civil society demonstrates this complex and far-reaching ecosystem. Woven into the interconnected environment is a delicate balancing act of border management that provides security for citizens while maximizing economic benefits for communities. Transnational criminal organizations exploit our shared border as, they, as the main entry point for illegal drugs, including fentanyl, into the United States and weapons and smuggled bulk cash into Mexico. We know more must be done to disrupt transnational crime and protect both societies and our region as a whole. Annual two-way trade in goods between the United States and Mexico totals more than $724 billion. But long wait times at land ports of entry cost the United States and Mexico economies billions of dollars every year. That's why the uh, work at the Atlantic Council is doing to demonstrate the economic impact of improving border management processes is incredibly important. A few years ago, the Department of State partnered with Sandia National Laboratories, a federally funded uh, research and development center to conduct a scientific study, a sampling of key areas along the U.S.-Mexico border. The purpose of the study was to identify opportunities where both countries could work together and use technology to reduce redund redundancies, increase information sharing, and improve targeting and analytical capabilities. Based on recommendations from that study, our goal is to use state-of-the-art technology and more efficient bilateral processes and cooperation to improve security and trade. With better communication systems, we can share information in real time with all our ports of entry and checkpoints. With better scanning technology and more precise positioning of that technology, we can scan significantly more vehicles through pre-primary scanning 
share imag imagery more broadly, and allow ample time for operators to make operational decisions before screening. With Mexico and the United States working together along with the private sector, we will leverage the study to reduce wait times, stimulate business, and make our communities safer. The investments we make now to capitalize on technology will pay dividends in years to come. As demonstrated by the Atlantic Council study, small changes have big impact. A 10-minute reduction in wait times from Mexico into the United States has the potential to create more than 18,000 jobs in Mexico. On the U.S. side, that 10-minute reduction in wait time results in 532 additional loaded trucks every month, generating an added commercial intake of nearly $312 million per year. Certainly, the innovation and improvements we are considering and what we should collectively explore will yield more than a 10-minute reduction in wait times. Decreasing wait times at border crossings is just the start. The border ecosystem I mentioned earlier goes well beyond Tijuana or El Paso. It includes redundant checkpoints facing truck drivers hours and hundreds of miles before they reach the border. It includes the whole transit time from packing all the way to delivery. What happens if we reduce the checkpoints and delays along the way for commercial vehicles? How will those 10 minutes increase to one hour, five hours, or even a day? The numbers do not lie. It is abundantly clear how even a small change of technology or reducing wait times at the border has a ripple effect, impacting communities and businesses hundreds of miles away. Let's not confine ourselves to considering only small changes. I challenge you to start reimagining re the border beyond its physical confines. If the border extended from Oaxaca to Chihuahua, what could we do to expedite that journey and reduce wait times even further? The impacts of what we're talking about are, are more than just shorter wait times at the border, a lot more. This border innovation will improve North America's global competitiveness and keep our economy strong proving that our open society and open markets can thrive while clamping down on illicit trafficking at the same time. This is another way we're, we're keeping citizens safe on both sides of the border. We can do better. We must do better. Let's redouble our efforts together. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from today's panelists. Now I return the floor to Jason. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Robinson. Uh, really Im important points on the imp on what improved technology can mean. Uh, and I also appreciate your contextualizing this insofar as the fact that this report led to 10 minutes. But imagine, imagine uh, and we saw the benefits in just 10 minutes, but imagine an hour, imagine, a d imagine, imagine even a day and what, what that could potentially mean. So thank you so much for, for joining us and thank you for your uh, leadership in INL and moving these in critical issues forward. Thinking about one of the things the Assistant Secretary mentioned was the importance of thinking about the border is more than a line in the sand. And that's the first and most essential step for building toward a more resilient, secure, and also efficient border. Before we begin with the uh, panel discussion, let me provide a little bit more context of the results of the report that we're la launching today. And this is a printed copy, uh, but for all of you watching uh, over, over live stream and over, over Zoom, uh, the uh, link to the report is being put in the chat, or on, if you're watching via live stream, you can find it on our uh, Twitter feed. Uh, but as, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, working with the Hunt Institute and Roberta, and I will get into that further, and as Colegio de Frontera Norte, our findings show that a 10 minute reduction in wait times could lead to an additional $26 million worth of cargo entering the United States each month via commercial vehicles. This translates to more than $312 million in additional commerce entering the United States from Mexico annually, with, of course, the po positive reverberations for Mexico, but also for U.S. consumers at the same time. We looked at commercial traffic, but then we also looked at non-commercial traffic. And this 10-minute reduction from non of non-commercial traffic would actually have a positive impact of 5.4 
million dollars, $5.4 million to the U.S. economy. And that's by essentially allowing for uh, a quicker flow of, of, uh, of, of a legitimate non-commercial traffic to come in and thereby uh, buying uh, the goods and services in border communities. For Mexico, it could result in the creation of nearly 19,000 jobs. And again, this is just 10 minutes we're talking about. We also found that the impact of enhanced border management practices is not just felt in border states. Instead, about 25% of the impact spills over into non-border states as, as alone. We also found that also just looking at a single minute, just one minute in redu reduction in wait times would increase the average production of Mexico's top 10 exporting sectors by 2%, uh, and even more so for the manufacturing, wholesale trade, and mining sector sectors. And I'll preview this. There will be a second report, which will be coming out uh, later this later this year, early winter, which will look at the study, which will look at the effects of enhanced border technology uh, in border states and border counties, in addition to the national level effects that we're looking at today. Now, our findings came about through an incredibly uh, uh, rigorous process uh, throughout this this year. Uh, they resulted from roundtables. Uh, focus groups, individual consultations that were carried out virtually across Mexico and the United States, including in-person consultations uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, in El Paso, Texas, and in Tijuana, Mexico. Our study used two economic models. It used one using U.S. data that emphasized the U.S. economy, another using Mexican data, which focused on the Mexican economy. And then as a starting point, both sides of the border were viewed independently to account for discrepancies in data availability. And then the specific methodology of local partners and local stakeholders were then, was then taken into account. We then harmonized those findings, the data, the scope, and the range of results to ultimately produce some of the numbers that we're sharing with you today. And there's uh, 20 pages of appendices in the report for further information on that. So let me turn over to our panelists. We're, I'm delighted to be joined today by Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, uh, Toby Bradley. Uh, das Bradley oversees, currently oversees the Knowledge Management Office at INL. Uh, he also served as Director of INL at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City and INL Deputy Director for Policy and Program Development in Mexico City. Toby, great to have you here today. Uh, look forward to your thoughts. Uh, we've, we've had a number of conversations for quite some time on your incredible, incredible visionary thinking on the, on the border. We're also joined virtually uh, by, from Mexico uh, by Natalie Krichoff. Natalie, great to have you with us today. And Natalie, congratulations are in order to you as well. Thank you. Natalie was recently uh, named by the New York Times as the new Mexico City Bureau Chief. Uh, she is also a Pulitzer finalist and a Polk Award recipient. Uh, in addition to her coverage of Mexico, she also covers Central America and the, and the Caribbean. So. Uh, Natalie, I'm getting on a plane to Mexico tonight, and so hopefully I'll see you later later this week. Fantastic. Joining us as well is Cesar Rimas. Uh, Cesar is the head of the Office for Implementation of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, USMCA, at the Embassy of Mexico here in the United States. In the past, among his many posts, he served as head of the International Trade Negotiations Unit at the Ministry of Economy. Cesar, great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, we have one of our partners, uh, Roberto Ransom. Uh, Roberto is the Director of Operations for the Hunt Institute for Global Competitiveness at the University of Texas, El Paso. And as I mentioned, one of our partners in this report that we worked uh, so closely together on over these last few months. So we're going to look uh, over this conversation at really what a transformed border could mean. What are the opportunities? What are some of the un untapped opportunities? And how can we work together to move that forward? Let me start off with you, uh, Toby. Um, the border represents, of course, we, many challenges, uh, but is also a source of incredible opportunity. <clears throat> and, it's, it, and also it's, it's a key point of collab collaboration and potentially even new collaboration between the U.S. and Mexico. From your perspective, what, what could be some of these opportunities and why is it important that we continue to working together to rethink how the border could work to better ensure secure and efficient crossings? Well, thank you, Jason, and thank you to all the Atlanta Council for having us today. It is a true pleasure to be having this conversation after many years of informal conversation and to see some real data on the books uh, uh, acknowledging that, that, that this is possible is, is quite uh, impactful. Um, we, uh, like Ambassador Robinson, I, I work for the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau, and our mission is to, to keep Americans safe from transnational crime and uh, drugs and, and protecting them from instability abroad. 
And with uh, over 100,000 opioid deaths last year in America alone uh, from the opioid trade, uh, we, uh, we, can't, we can't look at that challenge without looking at the border. Um, but the border is more than just uh, a fixed point. Uh, it, is, it is an ecosystem, as Ambassador Robinson said. Uh, I lived on the border. I, was, I had the opportunity to live in Matamoros, um, and I was crossing the border maybe six, seven times a day. I think that if you're living far away from there, you don't understand that this in and of itself is a, is a, is a vibrant uh, point where people are, are going back and forth all the time. And if you're in a business, your business is also potentially transiting that border uh, at several times a day. And the border, as Ambassador Robinson said, is not just that fixed point or for those communities, but it, it actually begins much, much further, further beyond. Uh, I had the opportunity to travel the route between Hermosillo and Nogales, and, and one could be stopped five times on the way to the border on the Mexican side for different reasons, pay, checks, agriculture, different things. Uh, and then after five checks, you can then be stopped at the U.S. border. So, uh, you know, when we look at that, the, this report is talking about only 10 minutes. Well, it actually goes much further. And at one point, I was told as the INL director <clears throat> in Mexico that, that making efficiencies at one of the, the internal Mexican checkpoints was my highest priority. And we end up investing about $6 million 100 miles or so away from the border. Uh, but what if we did more at our border itself and, and looked at, at co cooperative ways to do that? Um, so I, I think there's so much potential. Uh, and the idea that uh, by increasing security at the border will reduce travel, uh, illicit trade, is actually not true. And I think your study is showing that, that it, it is an outdated perception. The tech is better. Our cooperation is better. And, and so when delving into this, how exciting is it that we can actually keep Americans and Mexicans safer uh, while actually dramatically increasing the flow of illicit travel? It, it's it's yeah. quite impactful. It's, it's, it's a, as you're saying, it's a, essentially, it's a false argument to say you have to choose one or the other. And actually, the improved commercial flows <coughs> and security can actually come and should actually come hand in hand. Uh, tell me a follow-up question to you. We, we've, we've talked about this idea of a transformed border, you and I, in the past. From your perspective, what, do, what does that mean? We're, we're talking more than a, a line in the sand, but from your perspective, what, what could the border be in, say, five or ten years? What, what's your aspiration, your big thinking <clears throat> on, on, uh, on, on how that could potentially then change the way that we do business between the two countries? Well, if you're looking at it, uh, an average, uh, during peak hours, an average throughput of uh, wait time of 125 minutes, uh, and we're talking about a 10 minute savings, why can't we think about 124 minute savings? Mm -hmm. Why can't we actually look at even more efficient ways? What's, what's, what's the limit we can get? We partnered, as Ambassador Robinson said, with Sandia National Laboratories to take an idea that CBP was already doing. It was uh, unified cargo processing. It was being used at about uh, 10 or 12 ports. And these, these, uh, this, the, an anecdote from this basically meant that Mexico and the United States were doing the check together at the border. It meant that there, Mexico wasn't going to stop you five times on the way up. They were going to do it with us together, sharing information at the border. And what, what happened was um, businesses were able to get their, their goods through much faster. We had one company tell us that uh, in one month they saved $750,000. Mm. One company, one month. Um, and so think about the, the potential savings across the border. And if that's, again, just the savings at the, the checkpoint itself, let's move it back. That, that checkpoint I talked to you about, uh, that they said the reason why Mexico was saying they, we want, they wanted uh, the Merit Initiative's help at that point, now it's called the Bicentennial Framework, um, but we, why they needed it, there was up to a day or 48 hours um, backup at, at this particular internal checkpoint. And, it, and these are... Um, Trucks full of refrigerated items. We have upwards of nine, over nine billion dollars worth of produce that comes to the United States from Mexico every year, and and that means spoiled goods. That means uh, less fresh mm -hmm. uh, produce that are, are are coming into uh, our, our supermarkets. So all of these things have have a potential to potentially make it faster. And so I would just challenge us all to think: Well, if you know you can depend on not just a ten-minute wait, but a much as Ambassador Robin said, said, one hour, five hours a day, what does that mean to your business model? What can we do? 
The other thing that it does what we, we, when we looked into this was it wasn't just security, it wasn't just the economy, but it's the environment. There is also, uh, when, when using the, the, the 21st century border uh, pilots in Matamoros, uh, you, CBP found that there was actually uh, a, a, a decrease in the uh, pollution in the air because you have less, the trucks and, and vehicles are not idling as long, and so they're going through. If you have more automation at the border as well, you potentially have um, less, less threat to our, our workers, the people that are trying to keep us safe from being, being um, said, hey, if you do this for me, I'll do, I'll do this for you, or if I'll, I'll threaten you and if you don't let my, my goods through. So by having more automation, you take that, that interaction away. And, and of course, some people uh, have experienced uh, real or perceived bias at the border when they have these encounters. So automating more, making it more um, objective as we pass through has m many potential um, uh, impacts. Thank you, thank you, Toby. And it was great to be able to uh, have NADBank uh, participate in the consultations and throughout this process, uh, looking specifically at the environmental impacts, as you mentioned. Uh, shorter wait times means less trucks idling and, and that exhaust mm -hmm. going into the air at the border. Cesar, let me move to you uh, from a perspective from the uh, Mexican government side. Uh, we're, uh, USMCA recently celebrated uh, this past July, uh, two years uh, since its entry in, into force. So uh, I'd love to get your perspective on how you see, in, in so far as in being in charge of the Office of Implementation of USMC, how do you see improved efficiencies and border commercial flows enhancing some of the opportunities of that agreement that have still yet to be fully unlocked in its first couple of years? Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be you know, sharing the panel with you. Mm -hmm, likewise. Uh, well, first of all, uh, as you know, we have 28 years already, you know, of integration. Uh, we have built a uh, strong and complex uh, supply chains in the region. And our border, you know, is uh, also uh, very complex. I mean, it's, uh, I was, I found some, some figures yesterday. I mean, 370, 370 million travelers, 150 million cars, and 12.1 million cargo trucks cross every year uh, uh, through the 48 uh, port along the 2,000 miles uh, uh, border. No? So this is very, very complex. I mean, $661 billion in good, equivalent to 1.2 million uh, good, I mean, every minute. No? So this, I mean, the, 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 the we, we have seen very impressive figures. And, and of course, you know, the USMCA has, uh, was updated the NAFTA and in some had upgraded the, the, the NAFTA and allow us to integrate further. No? And I would say that this is quite, I mean, uh, in, in, in the, the government of Mexico and the US, we are working on the implementation of the, of the USMCA. We know that uh, we need to ensure that our borders uh, are more efficient, more uh, secure, of course. You know, and we are working on, on many, many fronts. Of course, you know, the, the, as, as I was saying, the USMCA included uh, key provisions, you know, uh, on trade facilitation, competitiveness, digital trade, you know, that will allow us to uh, make our world more efficient, but also laid the ground to uh, work on other initiatives, like, for example, the relaunching of the high-level economic dialogue uh, last year, well, that has uh, just two weeks ago its second uh, meeting. You know, it was key, you know, to continue working on trade facilitation, supply chains, and workforce development, and technology. So, but I wanted to highlight that uh, during that second meeting, there was a, um, we held a stakeholder meeting, you know, uh, because we see opportunities, you know, by involving uh, stakeholders in also the, 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 the work that we are doing uh, the between government uh, can allow us to, to, to improve further our, uh, our border. So we made this or uh, held this uh, dialogue with stakeholders on two topics. The first, uh, fir the first one was, on border, uh, uh, and border cooperation, collaboration, and, and the second one on how to uh, uh, strengthen and develop our semiconductor ecosystem uh, in, in, in the region. No? So 
And there were so very interesting initiatives, you know, on, on mobility of goods, you know, on how to simplify migration uh, processes, design new territorial uh, planning mechanism, and of course, you know, new border infrastructure, you know, and, and innovative uh, academic exchanges and linkage for workforce development. So what I wanted to, to, to highlight here is that we see a lot of opportunity to work to, uh, working, by working together, you know, uh, the, the government of Mexico and the U.S. And this is, uh, we are working on, as I said, on many fronts. Inside the, the high-level economic dialogue, we also included an initiative on uh, border management and trade facilitation. And, and, and I mean, uh, I think we need to use the NAFTA, I mean the NAFTA, sorry, the USMCA, the, the, the USMCA, uh, to, to make our, our world more efficient, but also any other uh, opportunity that we have, such as the age led no? as, as you're mentioning, Cesar, this is a uh, uh, Luz Maria de la Mora, the subsector of international commerce at the Secretary <coughs> of the Economy of Mexico, has a quote in our report uh, where she mentions the importance of the border for communities beyond the border, too. The, the yeah. Enhancing commercial flows uh, at the U.S. Mexico border will have reverberations and and uh, that gets to your point, and, and Natalie, that gets to a question for you as well, because our uh, study found that, um, that while many may think that the economic improvements are concentrated in border communities, that the over, 25, over a quarter of the economic impact of, of non-commercial border crossings reach beyond the border region itself. Um, uh, from your reporting and your uh, consistent conversations with people across Mexico, I'd love to get your perspective on how you see in, in enhanced border management practices impacting communities beyond the border region of, of Mexico itself. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for having me on the panel. Um, you know, I think it would be hard to overstate the impact that these delays have across Mexico. You know, when we're talking about the manufacturing industry in the country, when we're talking about, um, you know, the automotive industry in the country, the technological manufacturing industry across the country. These are no longer um, you know, border state issues. We are talking about an integrated supply chain across Mexico through the heart of the center of the country where you have um, you know, some of the biggest car factories um, in this region. Um, and so, you know, I think one, you know, if we're talking about specific examples, it would be hard to not mention the closure of the border, or sorry, not the closure, but what felt like the closure of the border when um, Governor Abbott in Texas um, instituted his increased uh, inspections of commercial vehicles for, um, you know, a little more than a, a week, a painful week um, earlier this year in April. Um, this was a closure that had enormous impacts on Mexico. And, and when you talk about, you know, what I hear in my conversations with folks, there was um, a real feeling of panic. And, and it's not just at the border. You know, when something like that happens, um, there was an estimate from one of the largest business groups here that it cost the, the industrial sector $8 million a day. Um, that's just enormous here. Um, and it's the kind of moment when you really see um, these ties tested. I think that moment also points to um, an opportunity and one that we've seen uh, Mexicans and, um, you know, you, on the U.S. side, folks taking advantage of more and more, which is local collaboration. Um, that crisis um, was ended ultimately by um, communication between Abbott and governors on the Mexican side. Um, and we have seen this again and again. Um, local communication and collaboration between Mexicans and Americans, um, not just in Texas, also you know, across the border, um, has shown itself to be one of the most promising areas um, to resolve these issues. Um, you know, I think when we are looking to the future for signs, you know, for optimism, I think that moment and the resolution and the speed with which everyone got on board from various different parties in Mexico um, is worth a lot of study and, and kind of 
points to um, potential areas for um, improvement going forward. Thank you so much, Natalie. Let me ask you a, a follow question uh, unrelated to Governor uh, Abbott and what happened in, in Texas, but looking more broadly at, at, at the border. And as we're talking about the potential impact of uh, 10 minute reduction, and as Toby says, maybe eventually 124 minute uh, mm -hmm. reduction, what are some of you, what is your reporting shown insofar as the broader impact of the current of current delays on local economies and thereby from your perspective what could be some of the benefits for local economies from this reduction from these uh, uh, reductions in wait times yeah i mean so first of all i still think that the premise that um this isn't just local mm -hmm. is is important to remember so you know, these border economies in Mexico are a major driver of economic growth in this country. And so when you help them, when you um, sort of even incrementally improve and reduce these delays, you're going to see a ripple effect um, across Mexico. Because again, it cannot... Um, we, we cannot forget the fact that these supply chains run all the way through down um, into the, the heart of Mexico. Um, you know, I, I think, first of all, the environmental impact is one that you hear a lot about. Um, I was really glad that, that, that we're touching on that. Um, you know, one minute less of a diesel engine just idling and running is... Um, it's not just going to have economic impact, but it's going to change the air quality in a local economy. So you hear that, um, you know, from folks in Tamaulipas and Reynosa, you hear a lot about local communities, not just economies, um, you know, kind of um, clamoring for some kind of improvement. Um, and I, I can't stress enough how much it would be noticed if there was an impact there. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that the manufacturing industry at the border and its connectedness throughout the country um, is, is it, it just um, is a fundamental driver of growth. And so um, kind of, you know, I, I think incremental is the wrong word to use here. Um, it looks incremental, but it would be massive and it would be felt um, you know, all the way down, you know, through throughout Mexico. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natalie. And I look at border communities. Uh, Roberto uh, is from a border community, so That's you can right. give your your firsthand uh, uh, perspective mm -hmm. and and uh, such a, uh, a a great host when we did our roundtable uh, at UTEP, uh, a beautiful campus right there on the on the border and a great partner. Uh, Roberto, beyond the um, economic analysis, as we mm -hmm. mentioned, uh, we had a number of roundtables and focus groups to better understand the needs and also the concerns mm -hmm. uh, of everyday uh, border users. From your perspective, what were some of the key takeaways from those sessions? But also, frankly, you, you're, you talk to border users all the time. Mm -hmm. So what surprised you the most? Okay. What did you learn that, that, uh, that, was, uh, um, that, that shocked you? Uh, yeah was somewhat unconventional from what you had heard previously mm -hmm. from border users? Uh, well, uh, first of all, we're delighted uh, on behalf of the Hunt Institute to be here to participate in, in a, be part of the report and provide those numbers to the, for informed decision making. Uh, when we did the round tables in uh, El Paso and Juarez, we basically took the pulse uh, to, from many CEOs from many logistic uh, companies, uh, not only crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, but uh, globally uh, through different ports uh, through Laredo. And uh, to start right off the bat, uh, one of the takeaways specifically concerning for the U.S. border is uh, that many participants express the need for additional advancements in technology as far as screening the information for travelers as you approach the port of entry. Uh, something similar to what uh, Secretary Robinson was saying. Not only while you approach the inspection booth, uh, as it is right now, but uh, increase that technology and bring it back as people are merging into those uh, channels and, and those lanes. So that's, that's one uh, pertaining for the U.S. Uh, side uh, or the U.S. administration. Then the second one uh, that you have is pretty much... Um, the understaffing of personnel, right? Uh, that continues to drive 
you know, many uh, long lines, uh, you know, on, uh, from commercial cargo, from uh, non-commercial cargo trying to go uh, northbound. Um, pertaining now to the Mexican side, um, m most of the improvements from uh, what we heard from many participants was the critical need for border uh, infrastructure as far as the approaching roads. When you're trying to connect into those uh, you know, lanes and the connecting roads uh, as, as well to the port of self-entry. Because right now, and I attest to this, uh, like you're saying, you know, I, I live in the border, you have a mix of 18-wheeler commercial cargo with your uh, personal vehicles, right, mixing and, and going through the same uh, lane. So uh, that infrastructure is, is overdue, is needed. And some of the discussion that took place among those, uh, you know, focus groups and, and sessions, and that's why I'm, I say, you know, it was like really taking uh, the heartbeat uh, in, in learning all of this information, was that for large binational areas uh, such as El Paso, you know, that is uh, uh, comprised by three states and two nations, uh, El Paso, Texas, uh, you know, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua in the southern New Mexico, have ports of entry with assigned functionality and assigned capacity. So a port of entry, just like we have ports of entry designated for sentry users, just designate a ports of entry specifically for fast commercial users, right? That will be one. And then uh, because many ports of entry are in the, in the heart of the city, they pretty much clog the arteries of the city, the, the main highways or even uh, boulevards on the, on the Mexican side. So kind of like shift that away, you know, to the outskirts and basically uh, have, uh, you know, uh, again, designated uh, ports of entry for fast lanes, designated uh, for all types of travelers and designated for empty uh, uh, containers. And one of the things that uh, really stood up, uh, you know, as, as, as a result of all, all these, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one consultations and, 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 and meetings was the fact that the private sector, they have people trained all over the, the, the world, right, that are clearing customs in, you know, in Europe or, or in Africa, and they can have some value added in recommendations it, when you know this this uh, dollars hit uh, the new expansion, so that was one of the the things that that we saw uh, on behalf of the Honey Institute. You know, it was really important to have the private sector participating, <clears throat> the private local private sector, but also multinationals that are frequently using the border. Mm -hmm. I'll turn back to Das Bradley, but first, uh, Roberto, a quick uh, follow up. Natalie mentioned the point about local communication and collaboration as being essential. Uh, we, we, I'd like for you to give a reflect on that comment as well, because we, we've we've heard that frequently the the importance and of uh, of just the simple things like communication and what that could mean for enhancing mm -hmm. uh, uh, efficiencies at the border. What I see a lot, uh, Jason, is regional communication, and I think a linear, you know, like for example on on uh, El Paso and Juarez. Why not to broaden that, you know, to Tijuana? in El Paso, and Juarez, right? So I think that's a key point where we need to focus on the best practices on those ports of entry that are doing the right thing because we have the answers in front of us. It's a matter of implementing those good uh, best practices from those ports of entry that are already doing the right thing and adopting that to binational regions like El Paso or Laredo. So yeah, that would help you. Uh, Toby, I, um I saw you taking a lot of a lot of notes as people were speaking. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to turn back to you uh, to give you a moment to <coughs> reflect on some of the different <coughs> comments that Cesar, mm -hmm. Roberto, and, and Natalie have made insofar as the potential implications uh, of uh, enhanced uh, 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 technology use at the border, what that could mean mm -hmm. for local communities and the communities more broadly, uh, but also uh, what it could mean insofar as the unlocking the economic potential and and, and some of Roberto's recommendations that we heard through our roundtables and how that um, uh, uh, jives with some of the conversa conversations that you've had previously. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I was taking notes. I'm learning uh, from my <laughs> colleagues here, and uh, and I think this is such a it's such an exciting project. Uh, there are a few things that I have worked on in my 25 years at the State Department that have the potential of being more impactful than what we're talking about today. Uh, Natalie talked about 
how it's not just the border community, but it's much beyond. And, and that's true on the economics. It's also true on security. Uh, the, the opioid epidemic and, and the drugs that are flowing and other illicit material flowing north uh, is affecting communities far beyond the border. It's in, in the Northeast. It's, it's frankly all over our country now. Um, and so every, every community is affected by this. So when we look at the costs, it's not just the trade costs, but it's also the cost to our families and our communities and our healthcare systems and, and, and beyond. Uh, so uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps that's part two, Jason, yeah. or, or part three of, of, of a, of a follow-on uh, study. Um, the, the, in terms of the actual um, the interconnectivity um, and the, the sense that w we need to have a holistic view of the border. And it struck me living on the border, uh, mm -hmm. like you, that uh, there are three different ways to pay. There's different cards you need. There's different, uh, there's different ways that you can pay uh, at, a, at, at different crossings. I learned that you could have, um, on both sides of the border, you could have a local, state, federal, private, or tribal owner of a bridge. Now multiply that exponentially by both sides. There's only one bridge in the entire ecosystem that is owned by the same entity. Do we know what that is? The Kansas City Railroad, who got their charter in 1875 uh, and happened to be in Matamoros. So I, I met the CEO, and, and he reports to a binational uh, board, and he collects, collects the, 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 the fees for that binational board. So it made me think, wow, uh, if we started thinking about how do you, how do you manage, uh, it isn't just better for security, but it's better for uh, for efficiency, and I imagine we can come up with something even better than easy pay, uh, <laughs> right? Because uh, all of us have been stuck at those long pay pay toll mm -hmm. as as well. So how do we get those folks who own them? How do they get their their income without slowing down international trade? Um, another thing, just in terms of the uh, how how the malicious actors they benefit from from anomalous activity. Not unlike uh, cyber, the cyber world, where you got to update your, your uh, patch your, your systems. It's, it's when you don't patch, it's when there's something that's different that people take advantage of those loopholes. And it's not, it, it, it's not unlike our border. If we have different an anomalous situations, we have inconsistencies, we have something that can get through here but can't get through here, the militia actors are going to know that, and they're going to take advantage. Mm -hmm. So if we can think about it more holistically, share that information across not just each other on our one side of the border, but across the border, and potentially with business, to say, look, we're seeing this happen. We're seeing that the illicit materials are being packed in this way. If you don't want to be slowed down, pack your materials this way. <laughs> think about the policies we could create together and truly transform uh, North American competitiveness. Insecurity. But thank you, Toby. As you're saying, I'm, I'm thinking of, as you mentioned, yes, many more, many more studies to show the, uh, the quantitative impacts <clears throat> of some of the things that you're uh, important ideas that you're suggesting. Uh, we could probably continue this conversation for another hour, uh, but I want to uh, first, uh, we're gonna, I want to move to a video from Ambassador Montezuma, the Mexican ambassador of the United States, who uh, is uh, on a plane right now and couldn't join us. Uh, but I want to uh, again thank you, uh, Das Bradley, for for joining, Cesar Remus for joining. Uh, Roberto Ransom and, and, and Natalie Kirchhoff, thank you so much for joining us virtually uh, from, from Mexico. Uh, so with that, let me turn to a video from Ambassador Montezuma. The border is also one of the greatest assets of both countries. It's a symbol of our economic strength and a reflection of our dynamic integration. For example, every day, 1.5 million people cross it in both directions. Every minute, $1 million are exchanged across our common border. When we come together at the border, we think about infrastructure but we also have to think about building trust because mutual trust will allow us to continue deepening our bilateral collaboration on joint inspections, information sharing, coordinated patrolling, and all kinds of exchanges. For this reason, both countries have committed resources to modernize our border infrastructure.
Mexico will invest $1.5 billion in constructing state-of-the-art ports of entry. We'll continue to support any efforts to achieve a modern, safe, efficient border and to respect the environment. The study that the Atlantic Council is launching, in collaboration with the INL, the University of Texas and El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, will provide us with a fundamental tool to develop effective public policies to address urgent issues at the border. Together, we can face this and many other challenges of the future. And I'm speaking about water. We have to include droughts and efficient water usage. If we want to bring about a more integrated bilateral relationship and a more united and humanitarian North American region, the starting point must be our common border and the time is now. Thank you and good luck. Well, thank you to Ambassador Montezuma for sharing that video. Now I'd like to uh, turn to Deputy Assistant Secretary David Chloe. Uh, so great to have you with us, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to provide us with some final closing thoughts. Over to you, David. Okay. Um, so good morning and thank you, Jason. Um, and thanks to the Atlantic Council for hosting this important event. And to my colleagues from the Department of State, Assistant Secretary Todd Robinson and Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Toby Bradley for highlighting key aspects of our department's shared efforts to increase and improve efficiencies that facilitate lawful trade and travel across our shared U.S.-Mexico border and support mutually beneficial efforts to boost economic growth for both nations. DHS, in coordination with other departments and agencies, including our colleagues at the Department of State, works closely with the government of Mexico on a daily basis at the leadership and staff levels, at the department and component levels, at the local level and Washington, D.C., on nearly every aspect of our mission set, including travel facilitation, information sharing, supply chain resiliency, and a range of security, migration, and trade initiatives. Any DHS success in executing its mission to facilitate secure trade and travel is a reflection of the close collaboration we have with a range of stakeholders and partners, including many of the public, private, and nonprofit organizations participating today. As the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated, unanticipated challenges can quickly and drastically impact the trade landscape, including by disrupting the traditional global supply chain and introducing new modes of conducting business. The themes discussed today, including specifically the findings of the U.S.-Mexico Border Economic Impact Study, drive home the importance of continuing to collaborate to improve border management policies and programs. Securing and facilitating trade and travel are mutually and reinforcing activities. The more we know about a person or cargo, the faster it can move. Further, segmenting flows in this way allows us to focus limited law enforcement resources on those people and cargo about which we know the least or we have concerns. For instance, under the high-level economic dialogue in the 21st century border management process, DHS and its Mexican counterparts have been working to ensure program alignment between our respective authorized economic operator programs in order to achieve mutual recognition. AEO programs allow for the facilitated processing of cargo across our shared border. Further, DHS executes the Global Entry Program, which is open to Mexican nationals and many of you are probably members of, and allows for streamlined customs and immigration processing when entering the United States. Through the 21st century border management process, the United States and Mexico are also exploring new ways to strengthen efficiencies for legitimate trade and travel, modernize our border infrastructure by prioritizing projects and technology, promote public safety, and combat transnational crime. DHS understands the immense economic opportunity for adopting new technologies to reduce border wait times as reflected in the valuable findings of the economic impact study. In close collaboration with the Departments of State and Commerce, the General Services Administration, and others, we are investing personnel and resources to maximize the capacity of both existing and new border infrastructure to include expanding vehicle and pedestrian processing infrastructure. We are also continuing efforts with the Government of New Mexico 
to evaluate the expansion um, of the United Cargo Processing, as Toby mentioned earlier, a program that allows for co-located Mexican and U.S. customs officials to each perform their customs processes at the same time, thereby reducing the amount of time spent at the U.S.-Mexico border. DHS is well positioned with the expertise and resources to continue supporting these kinds of efforts and is committed to continue investing in programs and activities that enhance security while ensuring legitimate trade and travel move quickly across our borders. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you here today, and I look forward to our continued collaboration on these important issues. And Jason, back to you then. Great, thank you so much, David. Really important to have, uh, have you participate in this incredible collaboration, of course, with State Department, but with Department of Homeland Security uh, as well. So thank you for, uh, for that leadership. Um, I want to uh, end by encouraging everybody uh, to, again, read this really important study. Uh, again, this is qualitative, but it's also importantly quantitative, new quantitative findings, as we've been saying, on just what 10 minute reduction could mean and you multiply that based on the conversation we had today in our uh, in this panel of what an hour could what an hour could be, what a day could mean, and what that could mean for broader border communities, and more importantly, what does that mean for the entire country of the United States, Mexico uh, writ large? Uh, there are a number of people I want to uh, end by thanking, in addition to our speakers today, uh, but the many contributors uh, to this report uh, from uh, here, at the Atlanta Council, but also UTEP and El Colegio de Frontera Norte. Of course, in addition to myself and Roberto, who are contributors to this report, uh, also Alejandro Bruges Rodriguez, John Bird, uh, Noah Aran Fuentes Flores, David Gaitan, uh, John Gibson, Camila Hernandez, Myra Maldonado, and Jorge Eduardo Mendoza uh, Cota, and Ignacia Ulloa here at the Atlantic Council. So thank you to all those uh, contributors to the report. And please stay tuned, because as I mentioned, this is the first in a two-part series where we'll, we'll be looking at a second iteration of what improved efficiencies at the border could mean uh, for both the United States and Mexico. So with that, thank you again for joining us today. And I want to end by, again, mentioning our hashtag today, faster, safer, greener borders. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve, and we look forward to working with you on that.